Thank you for joining us for today's message. You are about to hear a sermon by Pastor Brendan Beeler in our series, Out of Time, which is our study through the book of Revelation. During this series, we will be learning how to live every day as if it's our last. We are always excited to hear how God is working in your life. So if you have a story, please share it with us. You can do so by emailing us at yourstory@regeneratechurch.com. Also, if you desire to support this ministry financially, you can do so by clicking on the giving tab at regeneratechurch.com. Please help us continue to bring messages just like this one to people all around the world. Now, would you please prepare your heart for the Word of God? Help me out. Today is... Why was it only that the women knew that? Today is Valentine's Day. If you didn't know today's Valentine's Day, it probably means that you're single. And if you're not single and you didn't know that today's Valentine's Day, it means that you probably will be in the near future. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is a big deal to people, at least those who are smart and don't want to be murdered in their life. Valentine's Day is a special day, and maybe that's why so many Americans spend so much money on this day. According to the National Retail Federation, $17.6 $17.6 billion will be spent around this holiday today. Billion with a B. $17.6 billion. People want love. No matter who you are, everyone wants love. And it's one thing that people actually put their money where their mouth is. And speaking of where your mouth is on Valentine's Day, do you know Americans spend over $1 billion dollars on chocolate alone for this holiday, which equates to 58 million pounds of chocolate. And we wonder why by February, everybody gives up their New Year's resolutions to lose weight, because we will be consuming 58 million pounds of chocolate. Another amazing statistic about Valentine's Day is that people spend $360 million on their dogs. Now, people seriously need to get a life. People need help. And, and it doesn't, dogs don't count as your Valentine if you didn't know that. And if dogs who love people don't, then neither do your cats. Just letting you know, those don't count as your Valentine. You see, Valentine's Day is a big deal. People want love, but it's interesting that people continue to look for love without really finding it. There was an extensive survey that was conducted by the, in the United States by the leading polling agency. And the questions that were distributed to the people were of various ages and of various demographic, various nationality, and various occupations. And the key question was this, what are you looking for most in life? And when the answer came back, the analysts were completely amazed Because no matter the age or demographic or nationality or occupation of the people, the number one answer was the same. The number one response to what people wanted most in life was love. You see, people find themselves continuing to want it in their life, but not being able to find it in their life. But perhaps it's because many people don't really know what love is. What is love? A fourth grade teacher was having a hard time knowing that and really finding that in a series of relationships that she was in and finding herself in another relationship of difficulty. She decided to turn to her fourth grade class and ask her fourth grade class what they thought about love. So she asked, what is love to you? Trying to get some simple answers and The class was dumbfounded. Usually a class will say, you know, it's when you hug or when you give flowers or when you, usually fourth graders come up with all those things, but they just sat quiet. Not one raised their hand until one boy said, I got it, I got it. He raised his hand and the teacher called upon him. What is love? He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You see, many people don't know what love is. And not only are class of fourth graders having a hard time figuring out what love really is, but also adults around the world. You see, Google released what the top question asked on Google was this past year. 
You guessed it. The number one question asked on Google is, what is love? The question, what is love, topped the charts five times more than any other question asked on Google. You see, people want to know what love is. And so they turn to fourth grade classes. They turn to Google. And also topping the charts on Google is the question, how to kiss. If you have to ask Google, Google isn't going to be able to help you. And maybe that's why so many people are having a hard time finding out what love is because they don't know how to kiss. You see, people turn to fourth grade classes. They turn to Google to ask what is love. People look to Hollywood to try to find out what is love. But it's interesting, most marriages in Hollywood don't last more than one year. Unless you're Britney Spears or Kim Kardashian, then they don't last more than one day. People look to music to find out what is love. You know, the Beatles saying, all you need is love, sweet love. And then they all broke up and sued each other. And then 50 Cent only makes it more confusing because he sings songs like, I love you like a fat kid loves cake. And it really makes us start wondering, what is love? We can look to fourth grade classes. We can look to Google. We can look to Hollywood. We can look to music. But there's one place I would suggest to you that we should look to. To the one who is defined as love. Who the one that created love so that we could experience love. Love from him. Since we can't look to those other things, I want us to look to one place that we can find out exactly what is love. It's the one who created love and is love. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I want to draw your attention specifically to verse 4. It says this, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own is not provoked and thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. In 1 Corinthians, in these few verses, we have, number one, a description of love. You might want to write that down. It would help you to know what love is. Let me tell you, it would really help you to know what love is. We have a description of what love is, that it suffers long. That's, that's what love is. That's one part of love. Love is kind. Love isn't envious, wanting something from somebody. It's giving, self-sacrificial. Love does not parade itself. It's not, it's not sticking out, you know, shoulders high and, and chin up, nose in the air, thinking that you're something special. That's not love. Love is where you would lay your life down for someone, if need be, to walk over you to get to where they need to go. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love isn't boastful about all the great things that you did, but love deems the other person more important than yourself. Love does not seek its own. It's not in it for yourself, what you can get out of it. Love is not provoked. You know, when you really love somebody... There's really nothing that they can do to make you upset. If you really love them and you're walking in love towards them. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. You see, we have a beautiful description of what love is. A description of love. But you may say today, well, I know all about love. I, I do pretty good in that area. I'm a pretty loving person. People call me the love doctor. Well, then take the test, Mr. Love Doctor. Take the test. You think you're a lovable person? Then put your name in place of love to see if you really fit into the category of what love is. I'll put my name in there, but as you follow along, put your name in there. Brennan suffers long and is kind. Sometimes, uh, Brennan does not envy. I try not to, but oh. And then as you go down this list and you say, well, I'm not puffed up and I don't behave rudely and I don't seek its own and 
I'm not provoked and I think no evil and I don't rejoice in iniquity but rejoice in the truth and I, I bear all things, I believe all things, I hope all things, I endure all things. I never fail. And you realize as you go down through that list that you and I both fail miserably when it comes to the definition of who we are supposed to be as walking in love. And as we look at the definition and the description of love, it can become depressing, discouraging, disheartening because we realize that we fail. We all fail. The Bible says that all of failed and fallen short of the glory of God. We all fail short of who we are supposed to be when it comes to the topic of love and the love that we're supposed to have for each other. And this isn't just for your spouse or for your boyfriend or your girlfriend. This is for everyone, even your worst enemy. The way that we are supposed to live our lives, showing love is a command and a call. The command is found in John chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Here's the command. Christ gives it to you as a follower of him. Love one another. And whoever we come in contact with, Whoever is one another, the people that are in our lives, whether you are happy they are or whether you wish they weren't, we are called to love one another. It's a command of Christ, and it's also the call. The next verse goes on to say in John 13, 35, and by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So you are given a command a command by Christ to love one another. And it's not only a command, but it's your calling. People will know that you belong to Christ when you show the love of Christ in your life. It won't be the not of this world bumper sticker or t-shirt that you wear. It won't be because of how big your Bible is. It won't be because of the, the church sticker you have on the back of your car, especially when you're cutting people off. It won't be because of any of those things that people know that you are of Christ. Jesus gave one thing. Here's how people will know that you belong to me, that you are a part of my family. The one thing, the way that you love one another. We're called to love one another. And this description, this call, this command of love can become depressing, discouraging, disheartening because we realize it's our call, it's our command. And in this description, so many times I don't, so many times that you don't, we don't fulfill in the way that we're supposed to love each other. And this will bum us out unless we realize this. This list found in 1 Corinthians 13 isn't just a description of love in the way that we normally read it as, but it's also a beautiful depiction of love. Number two, a depiction of love. How is it a depiction of love? Well, you see, our name doesn't really fit that category in the way that it should. But in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it says this, God is love. God, he's defined by love. It's really the essence of who he is. He is love. It's in, in his very nature. And because God is love, when we realize that, we see in these verses a depiction of true love that God has for you. You see, although our name doesn't fit in this verse as well as we would like, God is love and Jesus' name fits perfectly as a depiction of love that he has for you. God suffered long. And he did. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, he suffered on the cross. Suffering for your sins and my sins. As the process of crucifixion was 
painstaking. It's where we get our word excruciating. Our English word comes, excruciating comes from the Greek word crucifixion. Really the best word that we have to describe the process. It was the worst way to die. And Jesus was willing to suffer long on the cross for my sin and for your sin individually and for everyone's sin. Jesus suffers long and suffering long for us. Suffering long for people not only that followed him, but people that were cursing at him people that were spitting on him, people that were beating him, people that shoved a crown of thorns into his head. And when they hung him on the cross and he was hanging there, bleeding and dying for our sin, he prayed this in Luke chapter 23, 34. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He prayed a prayer of forgiveness because the love that he has, God is love. That word is agape. It's not, it's not storge, which is a Greek word to explain a love that we have for a son or daughter. It's not eros, the word that we have for a passionate love for a spouse. It's not phileo, which is a word that we use to describe a friendship love that you have for a good buddy of yours or a girlfriend, if you're a girl. It's not, it's not that kind of love. Agape is not dependent upon action or who that person is. Agape is an unconditional love. You see, when we read God is love, it's really saying God is agape. God is unconditional in bestowing his love on us no matter the way that we live or how we act. He continues to pour out his love on us and that's why he died for us. You see, when he died for us, he prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. They were acting in complete rebellion. They were killing him, but he still had love for them and was willing to die on the cross for them. You probably didn't go as far as cursing God. Maybe you haven't gone as far as spitting towards God. But even if you have, there's still forgiveness and redemption and restoration because Jesus suffered long on the cross. Not only does Jesus suffer long, but Jesus is kind. He was kind enough to bear our sin and the pain so we wouldn't have to. The kindest act ever demonstrated. Jesus does not envy and Jesus does not parade himself. You see, Jesus didn't parade himself down the Rose Parade, but the Via Della Rosa Parade, that street that he walked from the city to Calvary. As people gathered on the sides of the street, spitting and cursing and yelling as he was being marched on that road that day in that parade, not parade myself, look how great I am, but carrying the cross that would ultimately bear our sin and our shame and the greatest act of love that was ever demonstrated. God is not puffed up. Philippians chapter two, verse eight says that Christ humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He's not puffed up, full of pride, but he was willing to humble himself, even going to the cross. The Bible says, despising the shame. But he went to the cross. He humbled himself unto death, unto death on a cross. Because of his humility, he was willing to do that for you and for me. Jesus did not behave himself rudely. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and he was asked by that thief, a thief really is a, a weak term to describe the two men that were hanging on the crosses next to Jesus, they were the worst of the worst type of criminals. They were murderers and thieves. They were insurrectionists, re rebels trying to overthrow the Roman rule. They, they were those that were zealots trying to stir up trouble. They were the worst of the worst. And the punishment for being that was crucifixion. And so Jesus was hanging with the worst of the worst dudes. But Jesus made it a habit to be there for the worst of the worst. And we see that throughout Jesus' life because he was never selective in who he showed love to. Anyone who came to him, he showed love to them. 
And even in his last moments, as he was on the cross dying, one of them was mocking Jesus and the other criminal, seeing this other criminal mock Jesus said, hey, don't you know who this man is? We deserve to be here. We've done the actions that deserve this punishment, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he turned to Jesus and said, Master, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus said these beautiful words, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus expressed love to that man, living a horrible life that man did. He was a criminal, the worst of the worst. But even in dying on the cross for sin, he knew it included that man's sin if he would come to repentance. Jesus could have said, you know, man, can't you see I'm, I'm dying? You know, I don't deserve this. Get a life, loser. He could have. He could have said, no, man, you, you know what? You deserve this. But he didn't. He offered a word of forgiveness and restoration. Jesus doesn't seek its own. He isn't looking for his best interests. Or he wouldn't have gone to the cross in the first place. Jesus is not provoked. They spit on him and they mocked him, but he still remained in the heart and the attitude of love towards those that were engaging in that very act. I don't know about you, but it's hard to remain in an act of love, in the heart of love when someone spits on you. I remember I was at the Spectrum years ago. I was probably about 18 years old. I was hanging out with a good friend of mine. Many of you know him, Ben Corson. He's also a pastor up in Oregon. And, and we were just hanging out at the Spectrum, walking around and we walked into a public restroom that was there at the Spectrum. And, and when we walked in, there was this, this dude with about five bottles of hairspray on the counter, a blow dryer, and an Afro pick. And he was spraying and picking out a huge, I mean, this thing was massive. This thing was planetarian. It was like, I don't know if he would be able to get out of the bathroom after how stiff it was with all the hairspray he just put in it. And so we, we walked in there and, and uh, he was a big buff guy, so we tried our best not to laugh. Uh, but it was, so, it was so shocking. And so we, after using the restroom, we leave the restroom. And I left first, and I was waiting outside for, for Ben. And on the way out, I guess he couldn't hold it, but he just smiled and laughed. And apparently, if you're blow-drying your hair in a public bathroom, you, I would think you wouldn't be struggling with insecurity. But apparently, this guy was. And so he runs out of the bathroom mad at Ben for laughing or smiling nicely at him. I don't really, I still haven't got the full story. And then he turns to me and he goes, and you, and then he spits on me, just all over me. Now at this moment, I had been training in mixed martial arts since I was four years old. And currently was training at an ultimate fighting center in Huntington Beach. And at this moment, I naturally wanted to have a reaction, but I didn't because I wasn't so sure he was a pretty big dude. And I wanna say it's because I had the heart of love, but I didn't, I was so angry at the moment. I wiped spit off my face, I just kind of threw it on the ground. And I said, let's go. And I walked away. And I'd like to say to you guys, it's because you know what? I just told him Christ loves you and he died for people with afros and blow dryers. But that wasn't really the reason. I was just so mad, but a little bit intimidated because he was massive and I wasn't about to test out my skills, although I can handle myself. I, I didn't want to find out that day. And so, so I walked away. You know, it's hard when someone spits on you. It's hard when people curse at you or get in your face. Maybe you've had confrontations. <laughs> I, I, a few months ago, I, this couple, you could tell they weren't enjoying each other's company. And there was a bit of a problem and and I was getting in the car with my wife and my kids. It was after Sunday, uh, we went out to lunch with my family. And, and I could tell they weren't enjoying life. They were walking through the parking lot. We were loading the kids up. I said, you know what? They need Jesus. They, Christ can fix whatever they're dealing with. So I said, I'm going to go invite them to church. So, so I grab an invite card and I run over to them real quick. And, and uh, I go to hand them an invite card. I said, hey, hey, guys, I just want to invite you to our church. And he turns at me and he just starts cussing at me. Just every word in the book. And I said, yeah, yeah no, no worries, man. I just... Just, 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 it's okay, you know, just wanted to invite you. I, I don't, you know, know what's going on, just want to, and he's continuing to curse at me. So I turned to the, the girl, the woman that he was with, hoping that she would just take it. And he said, hey, and she just goes, you better not, you better just leave. 
So I said, okay. And so I walked back to my car and it's not easy being cursed. I'm like, fine then. You know, I have no, I didn't do that. I wanted to though, but I didn't. You know, it's hard being cursed out. You know, it's, it's hard being spit on. It's hard when people talk bad about you. Maybe you've gone through circumstances where there's been gossip spread about you, not even true things, but people listen to it and then continue to spread it. Maybe you've been kept from a promotion in the workplace that you've been working hard towards because somebody was backbiting and slandering trying to get that promotion and maybe it kept you from it. And there's things that people can do that make us so angry. You know, there's certain things. We all have that inside of us. Don't look at me like you're all judgmental. There's that meter inside all of us that, that just kind of gets pushed, pushed, pushed as people are pushing us. And then it finally gets to the point where it's just like, ding, ding, ding. And that's usually when we react out of flesh, out of our natural tendencies. But you see Christ, he was being spit on. He was being beaten and cursed. And he still didn't react out of the flesh, but he reacted out of love. God thinks no evil. God does not rejoice in iniquity, but he rejoices in the truth. Jesus bears all things, and he did when he bore the weight of the world's sin upon his shoulders when he was hanging on the cross. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. God died for our sins. He bore our sins. He bears all things quite literally. He believes all things. He hopes all things. He endures all things. God believes all things. It's not that he's naive, and when we lie, he doesn't know the truth. But you know those times where you say, God, I'll never do that again if you would just forgive me, if you would just get me out of this situation, I'll never do it again. God doesn't say, "Uh uh-huh, that's what you said the last four times. Now you can pay for it. But he really believes you when you repent of your sin. And God, I want change. He believes that and he accepts that. He never hardens his heart towards us. And he endures all things. Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame or despising its shame. God never fails. Jesus has never failed in his life. He never failed. He never sinned. And Christ will never fail you. God never fails. And he didn't fail because three days after he died on the cross for our sin, he broke out of the grave and claimed victory to the world, declaring, I will not fail and what I've promised to do, and I will not fail you. Listen, if Christ said, if you destroy this temple, talking about his body, in three days, I will rebuild it. He claimed to come back from the death. He claimed to come back from the grave. And if he held that promise, which many people have, many magicians have proclaimed that they would escape the hold of death and come back. But Christ is the only one that was able to claim that he would come back from the dead and rise himself up, and he did. If he was able to keep that promise, then he is able to keep any promise that he gives us. He will not fail. He didn't fail when it came to dying on the cross for our sins, and he doesn't fail when it comes to forgiving your sins when you repent of them. God never fails and he will never fail us. So listen, 1 Corinthians 13, it's not only a description of love that we read it and think, oh, that's great about love, but it's also a depiction of Jesus's love for you. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus on the cross. C.S. Lewis said it best when he said, God loves us not because we are lovable or lovely, but because God is love. How much does Jesus love you? How much does Jesus love me? Well, perhaps Jesus said it best when he said nothing at all, but when he just outstretched his arms on the cross and he stayed there for you. How much does Jesus love me? As if to say to you and to me today, this much. Enough to willingly lay my life down for you. 
this much, enough to outstretch my arms and allow myself to be nailed to this cross. You see, at any moment, Christ could have called angels down to free him. At any moment, he could have said, I can't go through with this. He could have backed out at any moment, no matter how far he went, he could have. No Roman centurion nailed him there. No Jewish person made him go there. It was Jesus laying his life down willingly for our sin. People even screamed at him when he was on the cross. If you're really the Messiah, save yourself and come down from the cross. But it's as Jesus said, because I really am the Messiah and I don't wanna save myself, but I wanna save you, I'm gonna stay here on the cross. You see, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. It was Christ's love for you and for me that kept him there. We are given the perfect definition, the description, depiction of what love is. And that's why 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says this, by this, talking about the act of Jesus on the cross, by this we know love because he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. So what is love? What is love, sweet love? Where can we find it? All we have to do is look to the cross of Calvary and you can see what real love is, true love. Whenever we are in question, how am I supposed to love this person? You can look to the life of Jesus and follow what he did and you know that you will be walking in love for he is love. What does love love look like? To understand what is love, all you have to do is look to the life and death of Jesus Christ. So what does this mean for you and I today in the way that we are called to love one another? 1 John chapter four, verse 19 says this, we love him because he first loved us. But in other translations, it puts it this way, we love because he first loved us. So which is it? We love God because he first loved us or we just love in general because he first loved us. Which one is it? I would suggest to you both. You see, the original language in which it was written didn't distinguish between the two. It was one in the same. Because God loves us, We can love God in the way that we're supposed to. When you see what Christ has done for you and your sin, your failures, your shortcomings, when you see the cross of Calvary, you realize, God, you love me that much. It causes us within our hearts to say, God, how could you love me that much after how I've lived and what I've done? But because you do, it just ignites, inspires, causes a love to be in our hearts for God, but also for others because we realize Christ didn't just do that for us, for you, for me. Christ did that for everyone. And that person that we have a hard time loving, the person that maybe isn't lovable or loving, realize that Christ died for that person too. And if Christ gave his life for that person in our life that is hard to love, maybe it's a spouse in your life currently that's not being very loving or easy to love and and you're having a hard time with that. Maybe it's a a coworker or a friend, a family member, a neighbor, whoever it is, but you realize today Jesus died for them too. If he loved them that much, then I need to love them that much too as a follower of Jesus Christ. We love him because he first loved us, but we're also empowered to love one another. You see, when you look at the description of love, you realize you fall short. But when you look at the depiction of love, you realize I'm inspired now to love in such a way. It's no longer a checklist that I have to live this way, but it's a desire within our hearts to live in such a way, to be like Christ. But you can't give the love of God. That agape love, it's not natural to have that type of love when people are spitting on you and cursing you and mocking you and gossiping about you. It's not natural to love them. And it's difficult to love them. And I would even put it, it's impossible to love them naturally. But 
If you first receive the love of God in your life, then you will be able to give the love of God through your life. You have to receive it before you can give it. How many people know that's true here today? You can't give it unless you have it. You you, you can't write a check for a million dollars unless you have it. You can pretend you did that growing up, play, play money, and you adults that never grew up still play Monopoly. That's cool. You can pretend that you got all the property and all the money, but unless you really have it, you can't give it. You can't give it what you don't got. And it's the same is true when it comes to the topic of love. It is impossible to show the love of Christ unless you first receive the love of Christ. And when you realize I am loved, when you realize that God, almighty, all-powerful, creator of the universe, gave his life for little old me, that, that an all-powerful, all-knowing God would surrender his life for me. And you realize today, on Valentine's Day, I am loved. When you see that, in that beautiful depiction of love, you realize, because I'm loved, I am loved, and because I am loved, I'm able to receive that love. And now I will be empowered to show that love. Perhaps love has been missing in your life. Whether in a relationship or whether in your actions. Perhaps there's love that hasn't been being shown like it's supposed to be as a Christian in your life. All you have to do is receive it and you'll be able to show it. You mean, pastor, it's that simple? Just receive Christ's love and I'll be able to have Christ's love and because I have Christ's love, I'll be able to show Christ's love? Exactly. Jesus is asking you one question today. One question. It's the same question that will be asked more than any other question today. Four words. Will you be mine? That question will be repeated more than any other question. It's on candy hearts. It's on little little, uh, candy grams. I almost said Instagrams, but if they go quick, then I guess they're Insta candy grams. They're on cards. They're on ribbons wrapped around chocolate. They're on balloons. They're on everything. Will you be mine? And it's a question that many people are hoping that they're asked this day if they don't know that they already have somebody. Valentine's Day, it's either one of the most looked for days throughout all the year or the most regretted day of the year. All depending on who is asking you, will you be mine? Listen, everyone here has a Valentine today. Everyone here has a Valentine day. It's Jesus Christ asking you, will you be mine? Will will you surrender your life to me? Will you allow me to give you the forgiveness and the life that I have planned for you? Will you be mine? This Valentine's Day, though you have to give an answer. Christ has sent his Valentine to you this day. Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give all things? He was delivered unto death. He was delivered to you. He was delivered. You see, the Valentine candy gram has been delivered to you this day with the question, will you be mine? When you love somebody, you wanna give them something that demonstrates your love to them. Something that costs you, something that is important to you. It doesn't mean anything if it doesn't cost anything or if it's not important or even if if it doesn't, you know, mean anything, it doesn't show anything. And so what would God be able to give to you who was able to create everything? Gold, many, many people love getting gold, whether it's jewelry or Whatever it may be, yeah, something blingy for Valentine's Day. And all the ladies are saying, amen. Preach it to the husbands. Preach it to the boyfriends. Preach it to the single men. They need to know too. But you see, in heaven, we are told that God's streets are made out of gold. So some of us say, I don't care. Give it to me, Lord. (laughs) Give it to me. 
But you see, it wouldn't mean anything because what is our highest commodity on earth, gold, it's his lowest commodity in heaven. So what could God really show to show his love for you? He delivered up his son. And Romans 5, 8 says this, God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. More than a dollar, dollar candy gram, more than a box of chocolates, more than a balloon or a bouquet of flowers or an expensive dinner, God gave it all to you to demonstrate his love. God gave it all so that Jesus on the cross with a back ripped open raw from being whipped and blood dripping down his body onto the ground is asking you today, will you be mine? Will you give it all? I gave it all for you. Will you give it all for me? And for you that know the love of God and experience the love of God and have seen the love of God will be able to show the love of God this day. So what will your answer be? Will you be mine? Now, if you remember those candy grams in elementary school, open it up, there's a checkbox. Yes or no? And when I would make these cards, I would make the checkbox huge. It would fill up like the whole page. And then really, really small, as tiny as I could write it, I would write this tiny little box and it would say no underneath. And I think that's the same that Jesus does for us. I've given it all, I look, at how, look at this, and I don't want you to say no, but the choice is still yours. Christ came that none would perish, but all would have everlasting life. And if we are lacking in love this day, be that towards a spouse, be that towards a friend, be that towards a coworker or a neighbor, a child or a parent, it's because we need to receive the love of Christ completely in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.